Hello, and thank you for joining us for this conversation about design and heritage. This is a roundtable discussion between me, Toby Ash, the Commercial Director at Turquoise Mountain, my colleague, Creative Director Dr. Tardia Kennedy, and Turquoise Mountain collaborator and influential designer globally, Sebastian Comran. This talk was initially recorded for a carpet event that was held in January 2021 called Cover Connect. But in the conversation, we explore some really interesting topics that are of interest beyond the carpet world. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for everybody who's joining us uh, on this Cover Connect call. Uh, in the time of COVID, we uh, are all working remotely. Uh, otherwise, we'd all be in Hanover for the big Domitex carpet fair. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not happening uh, until spring. Um, very pleased for us to be able to participate in this cover event with Cover Magazine. And uh, today we're discussing, uh, with, uh, we have a discussion with Sebastian Conran. Uh, welcome, Sebastian. Uh, one of Britain's uh, leading product designers, and uh, my colleague, uh, Talia, Dr. Talia Kennedy, who's the creative director of Turquoise Mountain. Uh, and I'm Toby, uh, Toby Ash, I'm the commercial director of Turquoise Mountain. Uh, we're participating in this cover event. Uh, we uh, have our um, selection of our rugs uh, in the virtual trade section. Um, as many uh, of the visitors uh, to the site are aware that uh, Turquoise Mountain has an ambitious and exciting program uh, linking some of Afghanistan's um, leading carpet producers uh, and weaving communities with um, uh, customers and clients um, uh, around the world, especially in the US and, uh, and in Europe. And our sales team are during, the, during this uh, virtual event with Cover Magazine uh, are going to be available online uh, to discuss um, uh, our carpet offer, our carpet catalogue, and also all the design and uh, uh, work we can do for clients uh, to produce uh, carpets to their exact design and uh, quality specifications. So today we are um, having a discussion about the uh, link between heritage and design. Uh, and uh, and yes, yeah, so we'll kick off with uh, with, a dis with with Sebastian. Uh, whether you would like to give us a little bit of a short kind of biography, a little bit of background on 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 product design, but also during your career, if you could give us a little bit of an insight into where heritage and uh, tradition have inspired your your designs. Yeah, no, it started off when I was about six years old, and my dad bought bought me a workbench and tools and encouraged me to make things and um uh, uh and i'm a strong believer in that form fa follows fabrication that uh in order to uh design things you have to understand not just how they will function but how they will be made so my sort of tagline for this is form follows fabrication as well as form follows function which is the more normal one so um, I've worked in all over the globe and I've worked with high tech manufacturers, um, worked on uh, the Concorde interior, um, uh, car interiors, um, and worked with many uh, craftsmen in uh, Japan, uh, Myanmar, Kabul, um, South Africa, the UK, of course, and um, uh, I've also seen a great deal of change in uh, my 40 years uh, as a practicing designer, where um, communication was quite difficult in the early days, and we had to hand draw everything with a paper um, pencil, basically, and a ruler, um, and then uh, the fax machine came along, which allowed me to uh, send my ideas visually to uh, uh, other parts of the world. And uh, so that made a real difference. So uh, fax machine enabled me to work internationally. Um, and then with the advent of computer aided design and um, being able to email one's drawings and uh, have uh, uh, 
Skype and Zoom uh, discussions, uh, the ability to, to, to work all over the world has um, become very much uh, a realistic and achievable thing to do. You know, technology has had a, a great impact on the, the, the way I design and, and my thoughts. Um, I've also designed things using, um, you know, I have a small robotics company, um, uh, which I founded about six years ago, and um, I'm a designer in residence at University of Sheffield Engineering Department, and I work with a lot of um, engineers, academic engineers, uh, translating, uh, you know, the best of ac 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 academic know-how into uh, user experience. But I've also uh, worked with, uh, as I said before, craftsmen and potters and uh, weavers um, of, and furniture makers especially. And um, there you're often using um, products, natural products like uh, wool and wood, which are what we call live products. So they respond and they move uh, um, depending on the seasons uh, and the atmosphere they're kept in. Um, and, uh, you know, traditional wood furniture was, um, did not take air conditioning or central heating into account, nor did uh, traditional carpets. And um, so the the way people live is uh, very different. Um, you know, you know uh, original carpets were designed to just be taken out and beaten uh, once a month to clean them. But now uh, high powered vacuum cleaners um, can uh, uh, have a completely different uh, uh, effect on uh, cleaning them and actually to, uh, destroy them over over time. So you you have to take all all, all this into account. Um, the way it's people interesting so, when you're bringing up the carpets. I mean, I think you know because of course you know we hear you know discuss you know predominantly carpets and also actually just touching and, and leading on to our collaboration together on working together on producing some uh, uh, it really uh, uh, Persian inspired uh, contemporary carpets. Is just on touching you know. On, on your work in Afghanistan, because uh, this is, you know, uh, where we make our carpets. You know, you work specifically in Afghanistan. How, how did you find the process of working in that country and the artisans there? The difference between uh, working uh, with artisans and working with um, uh, industrialized companies, uh, countries, is that artisans, um, uh, need to follow two-dimensional rather than three-dimensional data. Uh, the specifying of, of the data uh, is important. Good communications are absolutely essential. So you need someone who's on the ground there who under, understands um, what, what it is. But what I was uh, coming around to is that Originally, uh, back in the day, before uh, the um, Industrial uh, Revolution, uh, artisans uh, would make things uh, to order and they wouldn't be made on spec so much. You know, you wouldn't just make a chair or make a rug. You would um, uh, be making a rug um, to someone's requirement. And... Um, so it's more likely that uh, you were custom making the rugs. Uh, later on, due to um, the way that retailing uh, came about post-industrial revolution retailing, um, uh, merchants needed to keep stock. Um, also uh, shipping, um, uh, because it took a very long time to get a rug from uh, Afghanistan to uh, the wider world, um, you weren't, it, it was very much more difficult to, to, to do this sort of thing. So merchants had to specify the sort of thing that they thought would sell well and uh, feed that back to the makers and the designers. Um, I also 
believe that the makers were also the designers um, and uh, there was a sort of tradition, uh, traditional template of how you would make these things. So there would be a, not a, um, a, a book of patterns, but uh, there would be a, a rough idea of, um, you know, what was acceptable and what sizes you needed and, and what patterns uh, sold the best. Um, but it was a, a slower pro process. Um, and because of this, there was very little room for uh, innovation because, um, you know, you would design and make things that had sold well, you know, four seasons ago. Um, and um, the uh, maker um, and uh, craftsman that had very little insight into how the um, environment where their products would 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 be used. Um, I suppose going back to uh, when uh, you had a, a, a more Bedouin um, approach to need of carpets uh, that they could be rolled up and transported, and uh, were actually part of the, the fabric of your home separating you from the sand, um, uh, they, they again had a, um, a, a, a different um, function. I mean, one thing that is uh, very uh, noticeable is the amount of pattern and detail in these carpets. And um, because of cultural influences uh, a lot of these uh, patterns have gone from being uh, pictographic through to uh, rather more mathematical patterns, um, abstract patterns rather than pictorial patterns um, and um, so that, that's also um, something to take into account. Yes, Talia, I mean, I'm bringing you into the conversation now. I mean, you've got a long background in uh, a TM and uh, working with the artisans, but also looking at uh, design uh, traditions uh, and with particular focus in Afghanistan. And I was wondering if you can give us, you know, a little bit of background of where TM look, stands on, on this and what's TM's mission on this, but also how, you know, this has informed the project we, we're doing with Sebastian. As you say, you know, heritage has really been central to the turquoise mountain mission ever since certainly i joined in 2007 working out in in kabul in afghanistan um, and that has uh, taken a number of different forms uh, from buildings restoration in the uh, old city of, of kabul restoring historic buildings and using a lot of traditional craftsmanship and heritage knowledge during that process to then establishing training programs through which master artisans are really able to transmit those skills and knowledge to a new generation of artisans. And then more recently, uh, which really is where programs like the carpet program in Afghanistan comes in, supporting artisan communities in making that bridge to commercial markets and enabling artisans to ensure production processes that not only work on an individual level, but also collectively so that they can scale and really build up that manufacturing capability. And all of that really relates back to the sense of inheritance, what it is that artisan communities uh, inherit, both from the environment in which they uh, exist uh, from the natural resources around them and how they have developed those resources over time to fulfill practical needs um, and also to uh, create beautiful objects that inspire and adorn their environments. Um, so that relationship is incredibly important, but then also it's about what they inherit from the people that have gone before them. And that's really where the transmission of skill, that hand making uh, is so important and that often happens within very personal relationships between a master and a student that can often happen within families uh, and it, that transmission uh, really 
um, is critical to the lifeblood of any kind of heritage and, and tradition. And of course, uh, that is where the commercial aspect really comes in. Sebastian, as you were saying, this is all about ultimately the patronage and the commercial opportunity for these traditional crafts. And very often that is uh, an aspect of the study of heritage that is not necessarily looked at. And what's so exciting about these kinds of programs is that it brings together, as has always been the case, the world of heritage, and the world of commerce. And that is what enables that continuation of transmission of skills and knowledge, and also enables that transmission of the visual language, which is so important. Obviously with our carpet program, uh, we have the full spectrum. We work with very, very contemporary designers all around the world who love the handmade finish of the carpets that we work with and that technical skill that those artisan communities have but also we work with the more traditional visual languages of Afghanistan. And those really um, bring that sense of place uh, to a product and tell the story, not only of the technical skill of a master artisan and the beauty of the finish, but also something of the cultural interaction of those uh, communities over generations. And in some instances, those can be handed across uh, through uh, watching other people make those uh, visual motifs, those designs and patterns. Sometimes it's even passed across through songs or poems that are held within communities and help people uh, in, in their learning process to uh, take on those different visual languages. And I think what's so exciting about the, um, the project that we're working on with you, Sebastian, is that we're looking at a very particular moment in the history of Afghanistan, where the designs of carpets really shifted from very kind of linear techniques to a more curvilinear approach. And those moments in time, to us now looking back uh, through a prism of 500 years or so, can seem uh, somehow uh, just part of the past, but actually those design innovations, those visual innovations were so exciting for the people that created them at the time. And it's so uh, exciting and I think inspiring to be able to look back through that prism of time and bring those design innovations into uh, the world of contemporary carpets today. Sebastian, and how are you going to, I mean, we've had conversations in the past, and this is such an exciting project, you know, we, you know, Afghanistan has such a rich uh, design and making tradition, and the idea of being able to make it, you know, increasingly um, relevant to, to international, you know, design savvy kind of clients is, is something that, you know, I think is really an exciting project because it will allow uh, uh, good, you know, large scale commercial orders to be placed with these and, 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 and allow weavers to earn, a, you know, a good income and producer companies to earn income. And I think this is a really important con contribution to the economy of, of Afghanistan. Just from a design perspective, Sebastian, I mean, how are you, you know, how are you going to, how do you kind of approach uh, a kind of uh, a brief and a project like this? I mean, the first thing is that we want it to be authentic um, to the culture of Afghanistan and to um, the, you know, we need it to be uh, traditional skills, but in the modern manner. And um, the, the, the difference between um, the way that carpets were made uh, then and the way they are made now um, is, uh, is mainly down to the availability of um, the materials um, and using, whether we go for using natural dyes, which can be sometimes rather fugitive, or we go to uh, 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 aniline dyes, which are um, non-vegetable dyes, which are um, uh, more light fast. Um, and whether th th this is something that we want to, to introduce. Um, but, you know, if we, you know, the, the thing is, if we go for the natural dyes, is it a more authentic um, uh, product? Um, and um, then there's the other thing is, how are they going to be used? How big do they need to be? What shape do they need to be? 
um, and um, the uh, the way that uh, rugs were traditionally used in a um, uh, Afghan uh, home setting compared to uh, a contemporary uh, uh, Western setting and um, see if that needs to be taken into account. Um, I mean, yeah, that's interesting. It's just trying to, you know, for the traditional use of a carpet in Afghanistan as a, as a fun, you know, it, and have a function within the home. And then yeah. we're placing it, you know, I mean, I think we're focusing on the collection you're creating for the, probably the hospitality, high-end hospitality market, is how, how you marry the two kind of uh, usages of the, of the carpet, you know, from that one context in a, in a home in Afghanistan to one to a, to a very plush hotel and how, you know, so that, you know, is that, a, are they, you know, clearly going to have to be compromises in terms of uh, sizes, designs, and, and, and dyes, for example, as well. So they are, as you say, they, the product needs to be fit for purpose in a modern, uh, you know, hospitality environment. Yes, I mean, as I was alluding to earlier, you know, when you get out your nail fist vacuum cleaner and you pass it over the um, uh, carpet every day, uh, which it will be in a hotel uh, environment, how well will a carpet uh, stand up to it? And do we need to um, uh, include any modern technology in the backings of the carpet so that the, um, uh, the, the, the weft doesn't waft away, um, as it were? Um, and the, I, I, the two things that, first thing I'm thinking of is authentic patterns, but in the modern manner. And then looking at scale um, and the scale and the size of the uh, patterning and the relative uh, scale, um, I'm thinking that probably we need to increase the scale. I mean, behind me, I've got a, a Japanese woodcut um, that's uh, uh, 20 times larger than it was originally produced, but I've blown it up um, uh, for use as a backdrop um, and as, as, a, as a wall covering. Um, and so if we were going to look at um, Afghan uh, carpets, would they be wall, wall coverings or would they be floor coverings? Uh, there's um, a wall covering tends to give it a higher perceived value than a floor covering because it's, it alludes it to being a piece of art rather than a functional piece of furniture. Um, and I can see that in hot hotel or hospitality, uh, situations where people might spill things on them and they, they will be wear and tear. Uh, we may be looking at wall coverings, um, but you know, this is, these are all things uh, we can think about. The other benefit of, of wall coverings is you can probably make them uh, rather smaller than you can do with a floor covering, you know, a prayer mat sized uh, carpet uh, hung on the wall is a, is a, is a de decent sized picture, but um, in a, um, uh, a ho hotel room or in, in the common parts of the hotel, um, it might be more difficult. So I think what we're trying to, you know, what, you know, to sum it up is, you know, it is really um, uh, traditional uh, culture, traditional craftsmanship, for uh, the modern needs and the modern environment. So that's, that's what we're trying to combine um, because uh, at, at the moment, um, if you had a hotel that which was uh, specifying these products, I mean, the other thing is the ability to, as I was alluding to earlier, is with better communications, you can actually specify the product so that when the hotels are being designed or when your home environment is being designed the carpet can be designed and they can all come together at, at the same time and thanks to DHL rather than camels um, we can uh, get get them all ready on time. Interesting you mentioned authentic kind of patterns but then 
made in a modern manner, you know, brought up to date. And that's interesting. I mean, what's the attraction to the client, though? I mean, if you go to a client who, you know, I'd say uh, a high end hotel, I mean, what's the attraction for them to say, OK, let's do something in Afghanistan? You know, what's yeah, what's what's compelling for them? What is compelling is the turquoise mountain narrative. And it's quite important that these products should have a turquoise mountain uh, signature to them, and they must be recognizably turquoise mountain, but not obviously uh, your logo goes here or anything like that. It's a, uh, a contemporary take on the authentic, I think is what we're saying. And, you know, there's one phrase I, I heard uh, uh, from Turquoise Mountain, you know, nothing uh, stops a bullet better than a job. And, you know, by employing people, um, it gives them, uh, you know, it, 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 it's productive and gainful employment. Um, and um, it, it, there will be uh, more harmony um you know I'm, I'm not not trying to say that this is a um a, a form of cultural manipulation but uh it, it you've got afghanistan which is a country which has a fantastic worldwide reputation for its carpets and the one thing that we know about uh afghanistan if you if you speak to people about afghanistan uh, there are various negatives that come up, but the, you know, the standout positive is uh, the uh, quality of its carpets and its traditional quality of its carpets. And, you know, the, the, the word Afghanistan uh, imply is a quality mark for carpets. So in the way that, you know, made in Sheffield used to be on the, on the finest uh, steel products uh, made in Afghanistan is definitely on the, the finest carpets um, and we need to get that across. The Turquoise Mountain part of the narrative says that by buying this carpet, by um, <coughs> using this carpet, you are doing good in the world. So it is part of the corporate social responsibility but um, uh, in a, you know, it's implied rather than uh, in your face and obvious. I think what you'd probably do is if you had a, a TMT uh, Afghan carpet uh, in your hotel room, there might be a leaflet there uh, which would tell you more about it, or there might be a, uh, some way of scanning a, um, a QR code next to it, like you, you go into a um, art gallery and there will be a little uh, card next to a picture telling you about that picture. And then you could just uh, read that and then scan a QR code and then learn a lot more about um, uh, TNT. So it's a uh, self-marketing uh, of, of the product. But in order for this to work, we need to have desirable, attractive products that fit in with people's uh, room interiors. And um, so we have to get into the mind of the designers uh, what, um, what they would like, like to have in the interiors. And um, so yeah, I'm just going to ping back to to uh, to Tali there because you because oh, you're the kind of bridge between the kind of the tradition uh, and the traditional uh, uh, the design traditions in Afghanistan and the modern designer and you're you're kind of leading on putting together a lexicon of of, of, of designs which can be used as a reference point for 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 Sebastian and other designers. Do you want to just give us a little bit more insight into how you've gone about this and and what this lexicon looks like? This is really. Uh, designed to be a, a tool that illustrates that visual language that we were speaking about earlier, but it doesn't um, just show the complete language as you would see 
uh, in, a, in a final carpet. It aims to break down into the individual components, the grammar, if you like, or the design DNA um, of that particular moment in time where there were a lot of design innovations and shifts going on within Afghanistan, particularly in uh, the western part of the country in the city of Herat, which was going through a great cultural revolution. Uh, at the same time as places like Italy were going through their renaissance, the same sort of thing was happening in places like Herat and some of the neighboring cities. And during the course of that time, really the early stages of what we now think of as the Persian rug um, were developed um, through collaboration. It was really when carpet weavers started to collaborate with other kinds of artists and were exposed to uh, a greater range of cultural influences that these different ideas about how to express visual motifs uh, really came about. And so the idea with the lexicon is to present that um, in a way that enables uh, designers, Sebastian, other designers to understand that language and to then put their interpretation um, to create, if you like, from that grammar, their own poem, which will then be used to develop carpets and to bring that contemporary feeling uh, that will ultimately attract buyers, we hope. Um, and I think the other really important thing Sebastian was talking about, the shift in patronage um, that originally or over many centuries people were making to order. And I think what has happened uh, in many artisan communities, not just in Afghanistan, but around the world, is that the link between the industry, the ultimate client, and the artisan makers has uh, been lost for a number of different reasons. Uh, and what this program really aims to do is not just to represent um, the design and the technical heritage of Afghan weavers, but also to bring back those links so that they are now re-enabled to understand the uh, functional requirements of a particular industry. So Sebastian was talking about uh, all of the requirements around um, durability, uh, around where you can place certain products within a hospitality setting. And I think that is really central to uh, the program uh, that we have at the moment to really uh, enable that link to uh, allow artisans to get back into those kinds of mainstream industries that perhaps over recent decades they've rather slipped away from. Yes, that's really uh, exactly what I was thinking. I mean, it's good that you use the word DNA um, uh, and it's essential that we do not lose that authenticity um, uh, uh, in there. Um, the other thing is to uh, allow these things to be perceived of as works of art as much as um, uh, um, just... Uh, <laughs> commodity uh, carpets and things like that, whereas there's a, there's a tendency, uh, you know, for there to be, a, 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 you know, for it to be seen as a sort of, oh, a Kelly rug or something like that. Um, and uh, to give design in value, design in perceived value, into the, uh, the, the, the the product, and part of the value is the perception of the brand. And there are two aspects of the brand in this case. There's the turquoise mountain narrative, and then there is, which is uh, in a set essence, an endorsement. You know, the, this by buying this uh, uh, carpet, by uh, patronising this uh, carpet you are doing good in the world. And the other um, part of the brand is Afghanistan, which is a uh, quality mark uh, or authenticity mark um, uh, as well. So there's the emotional side of the design, uh, which is what it looks like, the personality of the product. And then there is the functional side of the design. Is it fit for purpose? Is it gonna wear well? Are the colours going to remain uh, 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 
fast and all that sort of thing. And then, of course, there is the sensitivity to how it is going to be made, you know, designing it so it is reasonably straightforward uh, for the, the makers to make it. Um, it's going to be using materials that they can easily access. Uh, it's going to be easy to transport and, and, and things like that. So that's a form follows fabrication uh, at that end, form follows function, form follows feelings, and then, you know, form follows fame, as in the, 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 the narrative aspect of the brand. I mean, if, if I'm going to uh, analyze it in, in, in that way, I, I, I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. But what we're trying to do, I mean, the main, the most important thing is to uh, uh, maintain a perception of value. Uh, not a uh, perception of fair exchange, um, uh, but actually the sort of uh, value, like I might value Salia's friendship or I, I might value my favourite pencil, it's got nothing to do with how much it costs. It is just something that's f familiar to me and uh, makes me feel good. Well, actually, I think for everybody who's viewing uh, this this chat, I mean, he definitely, you know, it's probably whetted their appetite. Uh, this is really a genuinely, I think, exciting collaboration. I think the whole thinking behind it, it just so it's so wonderful. The idea of, of of taking these authentic designs and patterns and then making them relevant to the contemporary uh, carpet market is 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 a is a great challenge. But I think it's one that that, uh, that it's going to be really wonderful to see unfold, which it will be unfolding. Uh, in the ne in the next few months, and we will be launching the uh, the uh, range and the collections to, uh, to market uh, during the course of the year. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, both Talia and Sebastian, uh, for having this chat uh, today, and uh, we look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Talia. Lovely to speak to you both. And to you too. Bye, bye, Toby. Bye, Sebastian. <laughs>